Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon from Cairo local time. Uh, uh, good night. Uh, if you are on uh, the east side uh, of the globe, uh, welcome to the uh, the 29th International Conference of Management of Technology, IMO 2020. We are delighted to have this special edition of the IMOT uh, that goes online uh, for the first time. And uh, we are really delighted to have um, a distinguished uh, speakers, uh, delegates, representatives from all over the world covering the whole thing of management of technology and addressing the top-notch ideas about uh, the issues related to management of technology and how technology is impacting our life. And of course, we noticed that uh, uh, the recent changes in the globe. Um, my name is Nizar Sami. I'm the board member of the International Association of Management of Technology. I welcome you all. I wish you all the best with our uh, programs and our uh, uh, list of speakers. And please allow me to give the microphone to Professor uh, Osman Ahmed, president of IMOT, to start the celebration of IMOT 2020 online conference. Dr. Osman, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sami. Uh, Good morning from USA West Coast. Uh, this is about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I'm trying to keep myself awake. First and foremost, I hope you are all doing fine. Uh, dear conference chair, our distinguished guests, keynote speaker, Baroness Dr. Nimat Shafiq, conference attendees and students. It is with my great honor and privilege, it is with my great honor and privilege that I welcome all of you to the 29th annual conference of the International Association for Management of Technology, IAMOT. This is indeed a historic event as this will be our first online conference which is graciously hosted by the Nile University, Cairo, Egypt. When we decided about IMO 2020, we were all excited to visit the great city of Cairo and, and enjoy its beauty, culture, and history. We plan to meet and greet each other in the spirit of IMO friendliness and offer you traditional Egyptian food, and hospitality. But then COVID-19 pandemic hit the world and we came close to a standstill and faced unprecedented challenges with health, economy, education, transportation, etc. In short, our lives around the world became not normal. But facing this grave situation, we are bouncing back slowly and by exhibiting human resiliency and our instinct to continue to live and even thrive. In that spirit, IMOT has joined many other organization, organizations around the world to continue our journey by holding online conference. So that even with physical distance, we can come closer to each other and share our thoughts on the topics of towards the digital world and industry X.0, the theme of this year's conference. This theme is timely and critical as IMOT and the management of technology community at large need to set a new direction for the discipline of management of technology and innovation as we are facing global crisis in 2020 due to COVID-19 and other socioeconomic reasons. 
I hope all the conference participants will keep this thought in mind as you attend to this conference and many of its sessions. The heart of any conference is its authors who have worked hard and conducted excellent research in many fields of digitalization, transformation, and Industry 4.0. On behalf of IMOT, I want to express my deepest sense of gratitude to 514 authors representing 34 countries who have submitted abstracts. I congratulate authors of 134 papers and 20 abstracts that have been accepted by the Conference Committee for Publications. I'm also thankful to Professor Tarek Khalil, General Conference Chair, Co-Chair and Editor, Professor Leon Pretorius, and Co-Chair and Editor, Professor Martinez Pretorius, for their leadership and invaluable contribution in holding this conference and for its success. I also recognize the peer reviewers and members of organizing committee and advisory committee with great sense of appreciation. I hope to meet you all virtually during the online conference and very soon in person. Finally, my personal thanks to Dr. Nizar Sami, Dr. Muhammad Azam, and Ms. Haidi Mohammad Helmi for their untiring efforts in making this conference successful. Please stay safe and healthy, and let us hope to come together for a better IMOT and for a better future. So long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osman. Uh, indeed, it's also my pleasure to welcome all our speakers, participants, followers, and the entire management of technology community for this year uh, 2020 International Conference. Uh, indeed, I am thankful and blessed to be hosting uh, this year conference as one of the series of international and European conference that we started actually in 1988. I look back with nostalgia to the first conference uh, that uh, we held in Miami, Florida in 1988, where we had a vision for the role of management of technology in all aspects, not only in uh, improving the quality of life and the economy, but in all aspects of life. And our vision has been realized, but also expanded to be the path of the future. This year conference here is hosted by Nile University in Cairo, Egypt. It's a vigorous young university that was established with the philosophy ingrained in, con the, in the conviction that science and technology are the key to competitiveness, to wealth creation, to economic growth, to sustainability, and to human prosperity. It's indeed my privilege and honor to be president of this university. We plan to host this conference in April, as you all know, in a physical form, but we were hit by something that the world was never hit with before, which is COVID-19 pandemic and the consequences of what happened. And therefore, the board of directors of the association decided to run this year's conference in the virtual mode from September 13 to 17. And here we are opening this conference in a virtual platform. I would like to thank and express my sincere appreciation to their Excellency Dr. Khaled Abdel Ghaffar, Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research, 
and Dr. Amr Talat, Minister of Communication and Information Technology of Egypt, for placing this conference under their auspices. I thank the Nile University Board of Trustees and its uh, chairman, Mr. Amr Musa, and I am on board for their support. Special thanks to Leon Pretorius, Tina Pretorius, and Mariette Turk for their excellent work on the conference program. To uh, my local organizing committee, I appreciated very much Dr. Ahmed Radwan and his team, Dr. Khaled Aid, Nizar Sami, Muhammad Azam, and the many, many people that worked uh, to make this conference possible. My assistants, Hedi Helmi and Rana Sophie, and everyone who helped with this event. Uh, now I would like to uh, introduce His Excellency, Mr. Amr Musa, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Nile University, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt and former Secretary General of the Arab League to give uh, a welcoming remarks to our guests. Uh, Mr. Musa, uh, if you can switch your uh, mic and uh, uh, camera, uh, we would uh, like to hear from you. And then I will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalil. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, participate in this webinar. And I wish to thank you, Dr. Khalil, for your leadership. Uh, of the Nile University, the board of trustees is really thankful for these activities and the uh, role the Nile University is playing in the debates pertaining to the issues of priority on the international agenda. I am addressing you while I'm sitting on the northern shore of Egypt uh, I am, all, say, 50 meters from the Mediterranean. This blue, wonderful uh, sea and with breeze and very friendly sun. However, while enjoying all this, the topic number one is Corona, the impact of Corona and the impact of that pandemic on the life of individuals and societies around the world. Of course, we are all uh, aware that a certain change, in fact, a deep change is taking place in the way of life, the lifestyle, and the, the way international relations, uh, political, economic security, etc., uh, will be conducted. I am really very honored to uh, listen to the remarks we all uh, are waiting for of uh, the Baroness, Dr. Naama Chafiq, talking about the impact of the coronavirus on the economy. This is an important aspect of our debate and the people of the world in all continents are really flabbergasted. We all feel uh, uh, the, the, the impact on our, we cannot plan what will happen next year, uh, what kind of economy, what kind of banking system, what kind of international security, etc. And that is why it is very interesting and I'm thousands, not 1,000, but thousands will enjoy listening to uh, what uh, the Baroness is going to say. Uh, finally, I wish to welcome all participants from the four corners of the world and wish this webinar great success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Musa. Uh, we appreciate your leadership. Uh, now it's my indeed a pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker for uh, today. Dame Minou Shafiq, and recently announced to be Baroness Shafiq of Camden and Alexandria. Nermat Minou Shafiq is a leading economist, 
whose career has straddled public policy and academia. She was appointed director of the London School of Economics and Political Science in September 2017. She did her uh, BA at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, her MSc at the London School of Economics, and her Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford. And by the age of 36, she had become the youngest ever Vice President of the World Bank. She taught at Georgetown University and at the Wharton uh, School of Business. Uh, she later served as a permanent secretary of the Department of International Development of the UK from 2008 to 2011. Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund from 2011 to 2014 and as Deputy Governor of the Bank of England from 2014 to 2017, where she sat on all monetary, financial, and prudential policy committees and was responsible for a balance sheet of over 500 billion sterling. Minouche has served on and chaired numerous boards and currently serves as trustee of the British Museum, the supervisory board of Siemens, the Council of the Institute of Fiscal Studies, and the Economy Honors Committee. She was made a dame commander of the British Empire in the Queen's Birthday Honors List in 2015. In July 2020, Minouche was made a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. Minouche, you have many admirers in Egypt, and they are all sending their best wishes and their greetings. And it's indeed my pleasure to introduce Baroness Minouche Shafiq. Minouche, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that very generous introduction. It's a real honor for me to participate in the 29th International Conference on the Management of Technology at Ohio University. And it's a special pleasure to join Dr. Tariq Khalil, who has been a, a family friend and has known me since I was a child. Uh, so, uh, so a real pleasure to be with you and, of course, with uh, His Excellency Amr Musa. My talk today is uh, going to be about the impact of COVID on the economy. But of course, we're still in the eye of the storm, so it is too soon to give a full assessment. And as the famous Nobel Prize winner in physics, Niels Bohr, once said, prediction is very difficult, especially when it's about the future. So I've, I've labeled my talk initial reflections, uh, because what I'd like to do today is identify some broad trends uh, and, uh, and, I, and, and, and reflect on the impact of those on our societies. I'm going to start with a brief discussion on the economic impact, and then I'm going to focus on three themes. The first is a trend toward localization, the second, a trend toward digitization, and the third, pressure on socialization of risks. And those will be the key themes of my talk. So let me start with the economy. We all uh, are probably familiar with, uh, with what the recent forecasts are showing. The recent IMF forecasts show that the world economy will shrink in 2020 by minus 4.9%, roughly 5%. And then that there'll be a recovery in 2021 to about 5.4% growth. And that's a very common fact. That's a very common pattern. You have a big economic shock and then you have a big uh, recovery uh, afterwards. The big debate in the case of coronavirus is what shape will this recovery take? The optimists uh, argue it will be V-shaped. We'll have a sharp fall and then the economy will recover quickly. But there's a whole alphabet soup of forecasts out there. Some argue that it will be U-shaped. Uh, others say it will be L-shaped. We'll have a sharp fall and a very long flat period of low growth. Some have even argued it will be M-shaped, that we'll have a sharp fall and then a bit of a recovery and then another sharp fall. 
My own personal view is that it will not be V-shaped, uh, that we will not have a sharp recovery. Uh, and the reason is, is because there, coronavirus is causing deep structural changes in our economy, and those have to work themselves out. What do I mean by those kind of structural changes? Pick an industry, for example, aviation. It will take a very long time before we start building new planes. Uh, in fact, many of the major airlines have, have already retired many of their existing planes and have no intention of ordering new ones. British Airways, for example, has prematurely retired 10% of its entire fleet as a result of the sharp drop in travel because of coronavirus. Take another sector, construction of office buildings. There is a, a, a fundamental shift in where people work and how they work. And so demand for new office construction uh, is, uh, is likely to change. Same with retail and shopping centers. People are ordering much more online and where that settles is very unclear. And some people think that demand for shopping centers will, will, will decline and we won't be building any new ones until it's clearer what happens to demand. In other sectors, it's more ambiguous. Take cars, for example. Uh, some people uh, are commuting less because they're working from home, and so demand for cars could fall. On the other hand, many are afraid of using public transport and therefore are driving their cars more. So in some cases, it's very difficult to predict what will happen to demand. And of course, demand for services is hardest hit. In fact, most of what we buy is services, not goods. Services like going to restaurants or staying in a hotel or taking a taxi. Uh, and the pandemic has directly affected the service sector probably more than others. And most of those service sector businesses run on very low margins. A recent piece of research on the impact of coronavirus in 10 countries ranging from Greece to Colombia to Morocco to Turkey to Russia showed that most of the service businesses in those countries could survive for a maximum of eight to 19 weeks on the, on the kind of cash flow that they had. That's how much of a cushion they had uh, to cope with a sharp fall in income. So the service sector is very vulnerable. And because of those, all of those structural changes I've described, I think we are entering a period in which we're going to see a rise in unemployment and, uh, and, and some rise in, in bankruptcies in certain sectors. And that will take time to play out. Uh, and it's only when that plays out that we'll start to see a recovery in investment in those, in those sectors. The huge danger, of course, is that we, we see uh, we see a loss of all the progress that the world has made in reducing poverty in recent decades. Africa, for example, is entering its first recession in 35 years. A country like Egypt has been very hard hit with a sharp collapse in tourism, in remittance flows, and in capital inflows. Uh, and all, of, all over the world, countries are under pressure to spend more on health and on social protection to help people cope with the virus. So that's the economic context that we're in. Let me turn to my three themes, and I'll start with the theme of localization. We are seeing a fall in trade growth. The, the World Trade Organization estimates that trade will decline by between 13 and 32 percent. But what we're also seeing is a restructuring in the way trade is happening. Companies are increasingly trying to shift their supply chains home, closer to local markets. Many felt hugely vulnerable as a result of coronavirus and their dependency on global supply chains, uh, which were incredibly complex, was revealed as a huge risk. Take, for example, a, a ventilator that everybody wants to buy now for their hospitals. A typical ventilator will have parts from more than 30 countries. And in a context of corona where trade has been disrupted, suddenly assembling such a ventilator becomes a lot more complex. And so you see more talk in the business community about reshoring and kind of reversing the massive offshoring of supply chains that we've seen as part of globalization in recent decades. Companies are also changing production processes as a result of automation and the possibilities now of robotics and, and, and artificial intelligence. And they're also reshoring as a way to hedge against risks around protectionism and trade wars. And so this phenomenon of localization is, I think, something we're going to see over the coming years. 
So some countries are actually actively incentivizing it. So for example, Japan has created a $2 billion fund to try and encourage companies to reshore their supply chains back to Japan. Donald Trump has urged US companies to get out of China and shift their production back in the US, in, into the US. But this is proving incredibly difficult. And so as companies figure this out, uh, we will see disruption in, in global supply chains. We're also seeing a disruption in capital flows. The, the reversion of capital flows around the world away from emerging markets and developing countries was quicker in this crisis than it was in the 2008 financial crisis. We've also seen a massive increase in debt. Debt levels now around the world are higher than they were after World War II, and this is unprecedented. Emerging markets and developing countries saw massive amounts of borrowing, and the advanced economies, too, are borrowing on the order of 10 to 20 percent of GDP. And while we've had this shifting in the global economy, we've also sadly seen a decline in international cooperation and countries very much focusing on narrow national interests and national sovereignty. We've seen border closure. We've seen a phenomenon that's now being called vaccine nationalism, where countries are hoarding vaccines and protective equipment for themselves and rather than finding ways to share it internationally. And while we've seen a massive spending by countries that could afford to spend more to deal with the COVID crisis, national responses have been on the order of almost $10 trillion. International support to the poorest countries in the world has been peanuts. Uh, and the G20 response has been very poor and very weak. There has been a bit of a debt moratorium and some uh, increases in financing, particularly from the IMF, who've mobilized support for more than 70 countries. Uh, but the international response has been very weak relative to the national response. So that's on the kind of localization, the retrenchment closer to home that's happening in the world economy. Let me turn to digitization. I think probably the biggest shock to all of us in our personal lives as a result of COVID-19 is how much we can do digitally. Events like this would have been inconceivable a year ago. I myself found that I had moved the entire London School of Economics online in a week. And it was remarkable how, uh, how effective it could be. And there is huge potential to do more of this. There's one estimate that Europe overall operates at only 12% of its digital potential, and the US is at 18%. And most emerging markets and developing countries are at far lower levels of digitization. We've seen digitization take hold in, in sectors like communications and telecommunications, in the media, and in financial services. But it's been slow to take hold in sectors like health, and education and construction, for example. I think this crisis will accelerate the spread of digitization in those areas. In the health sector, telemedicine is taking off massively, as is digital education and online learning. Similarly, online retail, which is about twice as efficient as going in person to a shop, uh, is also spreading rapidly in the wake of the pandemic. So digitalization will be a bigger part of the future. It was already happening. COVID will make it happen faster. It will also change, uh, digitalization will also change the geography of both where we work and where we live. Suddenly having to live close to work is a lot less important if people can work more and more from home. And the advantages of big cities, of big urban agglomerations may be diminished if people can work more flexibly. Many, many global corporations have now announced that working from home will be a permanent fixture in their life and that most of their workers can spend about half of their time working from home. And that will change the geography of cities uh, and uh, the geography of work. But the other thing I'd say about digitalization is while we've all discovered the huge potential, I think we've also all discovered the limits of digital life. And there are limits in terms of uh, human contact and the fact that people really need it. And there are also risks around privacy and who controls information in the digital world and issues around surveillance. Uh, and so clearly we need 
to make progress on those issues of surveillance and privacy. And I think we need to find a new equilibrium, which will be a more blended model of the physical and the digital. I think the future is going to be a combination of high tech and high touch. So just to give an example, at the London School of Economics, we are moving all of our large lectures online, but students will still come for smaller classes, seminars, and more high, so-called high-touch interactions where, uh, where they learn in a, in, a, in a more human, more personal, more interactive environment. And so I do think the future is going to be blended, but the share of digital will definitely grow. Finally, let me turn to my theme on socialization of risk. I think coronavirus revealed uh, vulnerabilities that were already there but became much more obvious. And those were vulnerabilities around precarious work, people on informal contracts, the lack of health insurance, the absence of sick pay, and the fact that many people had very weak social protection and social support systems. In many countries, uh, thankfully, there, are, uh, there were social protection systems that were in place, uh, including cash transfer schemes, which could be ramped up to help people cope with a sudden drop in income. In advanced economies, we saw furlough schemes where people were uh, allowed to keep their jobs and the government compensated firms in order to keep their workers on at some proportion of pay. In Egypt, for example, the programs Takafful and Karama, which were cash transfer schemes that go to the poorest 10% of the population, were expanded and extended to include irregular workers. And these were very important mechanisms to provide social support. But I think the crisis and the pandemic has shown that those support systems around the world are inadequate, that people need more security, of job for their jobs and they need more security of benefits, including sick pay so that they can take time off if they do get ill. It also highlighted the importance of better systems of unemployment insurance and including workers who are not in the formal sector in those systems of social protection. We already have the ingredients of those, of those systems of social protection. On average, about 15% of the world's population is now covered by some sort of cash transfer scheme, which provides direct cash from the government to the poorest households in times of stress. But coverage is very uneven. It's about 2% in Africa, 22% in North America and Latin America. And the global average needs to increase from that level. And we've had huge progress in countries like India, for example, who have introduced such schemes with very large coverage of large proportion of the population. In addition to being to more socialization and sharing of risks at the national level when people experience huge drops in their income, we also need more risk sharing at the global level. Many advanced economies did whatever it takes to respond to Corona, but most poorer countries could only do what they could afford. And while many had massive monetary and fiscal responses to the crisis, uh, it, it, they, it would have been better if they had financial capacity to do more. I think a better international financial safety net, and we can talk about more what that would take in, in the questions, uh, would have helped more developing countries respond more assertively both to the size of the economic shock and to the health shock that they, that they faced. So let me just uh, draw some conclusions. Crises like this are moments of, 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 of terrible cost and catastrophe, but they're also moments of opportunity. And past crises have been moments in which we've seen massive reforms. If you think about the Great Depression, which spawned the New Deal, or World War II, which spawned the creation of a, of a new Bretton Woods rules-based international financial system. We've also seen crises that have had no particular uh, reforms as a result of them. One thinks of World War I, where the settlement was, was, was one in which, which actually laid the foundations for the crisis of World War II, or the 2008 financial crisis, where I think most people would agree that the response was inadequate. I guess what I would argue is that we shouldn't let this crisis go to waste. There are important uh, opportunities to reform our economies and our health systems that we should take. 
and we need good leadership to be able to do that. I think polling from around the world shows that those countries who have leaders who have used expert advice, been open and transparent about the risks, and competently responded through the provision of better health care and competent management of the lockdown have done better and have retained public confidence through this crisis. I would note that a very large number of those leaders happen to be women, including Angela Merkel in Germany, uh, Jacinda Arendt in New Zealand, uh, and the president uh, of Taiwan and many other countries. So we need leaders who will manage us through this crisis, we also need a better international economic response, including extending debt service moratorium, more debt relief, and more financing to the poorest countries so they can get through this crisis. Uh, and we need to find ways to build back our economies better post-COVID. I think many people hanker for a return to the olden days, to how it was pre-COVID. But I think we should, we should hanker for something better than that. We need to facilitate a transition to a new kind of economy uh, that will be more digital, that might be a bit more local, that will have better systems of social protection, and that will provide minimum health guarantees to all, as well as better support systems uh, to those who are most vulnerable. So rather than the old norm, old normal, let's build a post-COVID world that is greener, healthier, and more socially sustainable. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Minouj, for a wonderful presentation and for uh, an uh, insight into all the issues that the world are facing today. Uh, indeed, uh, we have a challenge, uh, but we have opportunities, as you mentioned in here. So uh, if you uh, don't mind, we can open the floor for a few questions and answers. Uh, and uh, we can go uh, from there. Uh, I have one question to start with, maybe uh, quickly. You were talking about 12% uh, only uh, in Europe of the digital potential. Uh, this, this is, uh, wh wh what do you think of Africa and uh, of other places in here that uh, still are not prepared for this? And how can we deal with this if the pandemic uh, continues? Uh, that's, uh, that's number one. And then obviously the issue of uh, socialization in here that you talked about, uh, which doesn't exist also in some countries, uh, particularly the developing nations and so on. Uh, how, how, how would, uh, how would uh, these countries uh, deal with, the, with this? Yeah, yeah. So the first question is on digital potential and the second one is on... Uh, Socialization. <laughs> exactly. So on the digital, um, you're quite right. I mean, in most developing countries, uh, the, the degree of digitization of their economies is far less. It's interesting though, in some ways, there are, there are some advantages. So for example, in Africa, Africa never built really extensive fixed line telephone systems. They leapfrogged straight into mobile because they had no legacy systems. Uh, and in areas like digital banking, uh, Africa is incredibly in advanced with M-Pesa and Kenya being one of the pioneers and now spreading across the continent. Um, so it's a mixed story. India, for example, with its uh, its national ID system now has a very clear, everyone in India has a digital identity and that's enabled the government to transfer money directly to poor households uh, using digital identities. So it's a mixed story. Generally developing countries are, have less digitization of their economies, but in some aspects and in some areas, they're actually more advanced. I think where we have seen it most acutely though is in education where in uh, many parts of the developing world, young people don't have access to an internet, don't have access to a computer, and something like 1.7 billion children around the world have missed 
out on their education over the last six months because of COVID. And that's a huge loss. And it's an area where I think there needs to be a massive catch up in order to sustain education levels. On the socialization of risk, I think this is definitely a work in progress. Most advanced economies have pretty well established welfare states uh, so that when people suddenly are, have a big loss in income, uh, they do get some support from the rest of society. Although it's very uneven, you know, the US is, is one in which sick leave is still not available to huge proportions of the population. Uh, and, they're really, and, and, and the national healthcare system is uh, patchy at best. So even in the, some of the richest countries in the world, we still don't have a, a comprehensive safety net. But developing countries have done very, uh, have moved very quickly. Something like uh, over 140 now have some elements of a safety net, be it unemployment insurance or cash transfer schemes that make sure that people don't fall into complete destitution. And the beauty of having that infrastructure in place is that when a crisis hits, you can suddenly increase the amount that you're transferring to the poorest households. Um, and so I think, I, I think what I'd say is we have, the, we have the building blocks in many countries and we just need to develop them further and COVID has shown us how important that is. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions for, uh, coming from all over the world actually. <laughs> I have one question, Dr. Tor as well. Okay, go ahead. If you allow me, Dr. Shafi, uh, it's an honor to, to have you in uh, IAMOT. Uh, I'm Mohammed Azam, I'm a board member of IAMOT, and uh, uh, I'm honored, of course, and privileged to be part of your uh, session. Um, uh, I think we have another problem adding to the digital divide that is unemployment, mainly for uh, low and medium scale people. If we look at uh, uh, the unemployment rate before uh, COVID-19, it was like uh, 173 million around the world, around 5% of the global workforce, and it was expected to, uh, to have uh, uh, 174 million uh, people in 2020. However, after uh, the eruption of the virus, uh, 66 million people uh, lost their jobs in the G7 uh, countries, uh, which is a huge uh, number, and uh, this will lead to uh, a lot of uh, serious issues on the economic and social and security levels as well. Um, uh, if you look at the, uh, of the structure of the economy worldwide before uh, the COVID, uh, it was 63% uh, or two, almost two-thirds of the world economy is based on services um, and 30% um, on industrial uh, sector and uh, only 7% on uh, agriculture sector. Um, uh, the, uh, for years and years, uh, the, uh, uh, the service sector has been promoted by the international um, uh, institutions, uh, the World Bank, IMF, even uh, the big players in, uh, like uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, McKinsey, and so on and so forth, as the driver and locomotive of uh, uh, the overall development within uh, the society and uh, the main driver for employment and COVID proved all the opposite actually. It proved that it's very fragile, it proved that is uh, uh, actually it is helping to, to have uh, uh, a faster way of development, however it's an, uh, is not a resilient uh, economy and, uh, uh, and now we are in a, uh, I think in, uh, in a point that we need to uh, have uh, a restructure of the global economy to have a, a sort of a balanced economy between the service economy, of course, and the agriculture and the industry. How we can, uh, what is the formula of having uh, such uh, a balanced economy, Dr. Shafi? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think, um, I, I think the the economic logic actually goes against what you're what you're arguing in the sense that I actually anticipate that manufacturing is going to become less labor intensive going forward because of automation. And so there will be fewer people employed in manufacturing. And at some level, that's a good thing because that means manufacturing is becoming more productive. You know, I've seen chemical plants in Germany, which are run by one guy with six computer screens. And he can actually run six chemical plants from that one computer set of computer screens. Uh, and the entire factory is run by robots and automation. And I think more and more we are going to see automation 
coming to dominate large sectors of manufacturing. So I think there's no escaping services being the sector that's going to continue to employ the vast majority of the population. The dilemma that COVID has created is how do we make the service sector safe? Now, part of it is that we've discovered that we can actually deliver lots of services online. Um, so everyone from lawyers to architects to bankers to shoppers can uh, deliver those kind of services online. And I think that will be a, what we'll see increasingly is the digitization of services. And then for those services that cannot be delivered online, like getting your hair cut, uh, we're going to have to see, uh, you know, I'm afraid those sectors are going to suffer until we have a vaccine and other ways to, um, to cope. There's a more medium term issue, I think, which we also need to think about, which is how do we prevent the next pandemic? I think we have seen the costs, the devastating costs of this pandemic. And so there's a medium term agenda of making sure that we have systems in place to prevent future pandemics so that the service sector that does rely on physical contact can continue to function. Thank you. Thank you, Minush uh, Nezad. Dr. Hassan Ali, I think our Dean of the School of Business and Economics has a question. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. Thank you, Nizar. And uh, I have uh, the privilege of uh, knowing Poanes uh, uh, Minush a long time ago. We sat together on the Board of Trustees of the Economic Research Forum. And uh, I'm co of course, I'm following her great achievements uh, all the time. You are challenging. Uh, Everybody, uh, Menush. So everybody is following you. Uh, we actually have uh, a, a, another term, by the way, another uh, letter to add to the uh, alphabet soup. Uh, now they call it the K. Uh, K because you go down and then some of the sector will go up and some of the sector will, will go down. So that's another, another letter just to add. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and I, I collected these as well uh, because uh, I thought that your wisdom in giving us some uh, kind of uh, interpretation. One of the things that I was very hopeful actually to learn from is the uh, experiment that was going on in the US. Uh, some of the state has uh, started uh, uh, along the federal guideline some of the others started after the federal guideline and some uh, were speeding up. But uh, the latest uh, research that was done, uh, and here is the reference for it, they actually find out that uh, there is no great difference uh, between the state that has maintained longer lockdown versus those that relax the early lockdown. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really getting confused about it because I thought that this will be one of the major uh, determinant for that matter, uh, but it, it did not. More than that, that's another piece of research that was done also in June, uh, where basically they found out uh, from the foot traffic of 2.25 million business across the United States that only, uh, of course, controlling for mortality and so on, uh, that the local lockdown amounted for explaining 7% point of the average 60% drop in the uh, local consumer food traffic. So again, it, what is going on? I mean, this is uh, quite strange. Not only on the medical level, we don't know what this virus is bringing us, but on the economic level, we are also uh, starting to believe that there is nothing consistent in the things. Uh, however, there is something that I, uh, I thought I will take your uh, uh, pulse on. Uh, McKinsey came up with this uh, notion that for every three months delay in getting the virus under control, uh, the OECD countries uh, will have uh, six months delay in the recovery of the GDP. I don't know how they did this, but it seems like it's one of the things that is going on. Uh, one of the other things I thought I will also pick your brain on this, uh, because you, what, you are, what you are saying here is really radical. I'm talking about localization, digitalization, uh, socialization. You know, if we are going into that direction, uh, there are a lot of things that will be turned upside down as far as 
the world economy is concerned. Uh, so uh, for localization, uh, how about now export promotion versus import substitution? Uh, because we know that localization might lead to inefficiency given the comparative advantage and so on. Uh, also, the, 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 the mega project that goes on around uh, the countries versus the emphasis on a startup and a small and medium enterprise. Which way should we go? Uh, same thing about the industrial pattern, uh, whether it's heavy, sophisticated or light agribusiness retail. Uh, that's a lot of uh, choices now that have been opened up. And what was going on is even more uh, uh, confusing for me. Definitely oil and gas versus natural resources is another way to, uh, to ponder. Last, and this is my own... Uh, Those are too many questions. <laughs> this, this, this is discussion rather than a question. But I just wanted to see how she will perceive the, uh, uh, the election in the U.S., how this election might actually impact uh, the global economy, whether it's U.S.-China relation, whether it's uh, Mr. Trump uh, protectionism versus the Democrat... Uh, uh, liberal uh, trade and so on. I'm very, very, very privileged uh, to, to be on your panel, Ronas uh, Manoush, and I'm looking forward to your answer. Thank you very much for all of those uh, very interesting comments and questions. I'll just have a few reactions. On the fact that we saw that we saw that different approaches to lockdown didn't necessarily have a big impact on uh, the economic outcomes. I think what was going on there, and I've seen similar research done comparing, say, Sweden, who had a, a more, uh, a, less, uh, a, a less regulatory and legal, re legally strict version of lockdown, say, compared to the UK or France or the US. People restrained themselves. I think what was going on was that even in a country like Sweden, where they didn't have a full lockdown, people just didn't go out. They didn't, they didn't go to restaurants as much. They didn't go out shopping as much. And so I think when, what we observe is that uh, people exercised quite a lot of self-restraint. Uh, and that's why we saw quite similar patterns of declining demand in countries that had very different approaches to lockdown. I think on uh, the economic strategy implications of these trends of localization and digitization, um, you know, I think if you're a large economy, you have the advantage of a, of a large domestic market, and that will be a benefit. I am very worried that smaller developing countries who got some benefits from plugging into global supply chains may lose that. Uh, so you think of, uh, you know, countries that, say, Morocco, for example, who's managed to plug into the French car production industry and is producing inputs to uh, French car manufacturing. If those French companies reshore some of that production, will they lose the value-added opportunities that come from that? And so I think we need to try and think really hard about the, the implications of that and make sure that the, the, that the losses are not too large. And then finally on the election, I'm not gonna try, predicting the election is even tougher than predicting the economy. But what I would say is that I think the tensions, the economic tensions between the US and China are not just about this administration. I think the Democratic Party too has uh, strong concerns about China. And I fear that this kind of bifurcation of the global economy into a kind of Chinese zone and a kind of US zone uh, is, uh, is a real risk. And I think it will, there will be economic tensions between the two uh, regardless of the outcome of the election. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much. Nezad, we have a bunch of uh, questions coming in, uh, actually, a whole bunch of them, if you would bear with us, uh, Minush. Nezad, would you handle? Uh, would yeah, you ask? Yes, yeah. thank you, Dr. Tare. Thank you, Dr. Minush, for the very insightful uh, uh, talk and um, uh, insights. Um, actually, we received like more than 20 questions uh, right now. So I will uh, please allow me that I will open the microphone for the delegates uh, just to uh, to have the ability to talk and the, to, to address the question uh, for your uh, good self. So let's start with uh, uh, Angus uh, Belair 
please uh, be ready just to uh, be able to uh, um, um, ask the question. Uh, to, qu to ask him the question. Okay. Uh, are you there? Hello. Okay. Well, Angus was asking, uh, what do you think of corporate governance? Mm -hmm. And uh, ESG are increasingly important for shareholders and stakeholders and capital markets and the economy at large. Can you describe what you think of uh, sure. that corporate governance? Absolutely. I think um, clearly pre-COVID, this was had huge uh, momentum in uh, in capital markets and companies were under huge pressure to, uh, to do more on environmental, social and governance issues. I think there are many drivers to this. One is that um, there's a whole younger generation of investors. There's something like 35 trillion that's about to be inherited by millennials and younger going forward. And they have very different views about what they want, invest, what they want to invest in. I think there are employment issues. So a company like Unilever, for example, that puts a huge emphasis on environmental, social and governance issues, gets 2 million applicants a year of young people who want to work for them. And so it makes you very attractive as an employer. Uh, and I think the, more recently, we're seeing financial markets reward companies who do well on ESG. Because if you do badly and you take a big reputational hit, we've all seen what happens to share prices of companies that suffer from that. I think COVID has changed that agenda a little bit. And I think a lot of it now is also about uh, your ability to retain employees during uh, a crisis. And I think that's a huge challenge for many companies, but, uh, but it's added another dimension to the ESG agenda. Uh, and those that can afford to retain workers, sometimes part-time uh, and keep them productive during this crisis uh, are being appreciated both uh, by their employees, but I think in the longer term also by shareholders. Okay, thank we, you. We have a couple of uh, questions in here. Is Fabio Paula there? Uh, can you open for Fabio? Okay. Uh, uh, still here. Uh, I couldn't see him in the uh, right now in the list. Okay, tell me, uh, see, Fabio, we have the question. The from, question okay, is, would you, yeah. you bet on any technological disruptions uh, as a consequence of the pandemic in the future? Well, bet on technological disruptions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> like <laughs> things uh, considering online shopping uh, or distance medicine or uh, distance work or education distance education, for example, would that uh, be uh, something that would happen more? I think a lot of the changes that we are seeing now will, uh, will persist. I think areas like telemedicine, for example, or online shopping or, uh, or, um, or online education will become, will definitely increase. I think the levels may not be quite as high as we have to do now because we have no choice. Um, so people may still like to go to shops at some point in the future, but I think the broad trend, I think COVID has made this, has, will just definitely permanently accelerate the share of the digital economy going forward relative to the pre-COVID world. I have no doubt about that. Thank you. We have a question from David uh, Walwyn. Uh, David, your microphone is on, so can you please uh, unmute yourself and give the talk? David? Are you with us? Thank, thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you, first of all, yes. for a very inspiring talk. Um, I, I was particularly interested in the concept of socialization. Um, and the way that I understood it was that it was going much broader than just redefining morality or questions of justice. So I would talk about issues of social justice or environmental justice, that it was almost a political quest. So I'm really asking this question about, and we seem to be in a, in a world in which we see growing and very aggressive nationalism and populism, which is working against the kinds of values that I think we need and maybe that we're being referred to in socialization. How do you see this tension then between 
your role of socialization and the issue of, um, of transition. Of transition? Well, the, I guess, uh, yeah, it's more the, the tension between socialization um, and the, the political trend that we seem to be facing. Right. So I th when I talk about socialization of risk, what I'm referring to is that we're, we've created an economy in where individuals are carrying a lot of risk. Uh, and over time, they're carrying more risk. So they don't necessarily have a permanent contract. Uh, if they get sick, they have to cover a lot of the health costs themselves. They don't necessarily get a secure pension in old age. Their pension might be a defined contribution pension where they don't know what their income will be when they're old. And so more and more, we have asked individuals to carry more risks. And I guess what I'm arguing is that because of COVID, the risks of that strategy have been shown to be so apparent. And I think citizens around the world are going to ask for more of those risks to be shared collectively. And the reason I think that makes sense is not just because, oh, it's, it's a nice thing to do uh, or it's socially responsible. It's actually more efficient to share those risks over large pools of the population. Uh, because having individuals carry, say, all the risks of their own health care is suboptimal. Um, and so I think there are many areas in which that so people will ask for that in the area of work, around security of work and benefits, in the area of health care, in terms of pooling more risks collectively, and also in the area of education and skills. If, if we, we know there will be economic disruptions as a result of COVID, people will lose their jobs, firms will go bust. But what we need to do is support people to transition to new jobs. And that can only happen if we have ways to reskill and retool and give people educational opportunities and facilitate their moves to the jobs of the future. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Kamakshi uh, Sharma. Uh, microphone is on. Kamakshi, please address your question uh, to uh, Dr. Minosh about uh, tourism. Yes, you can go Hi, on. Dr. Hi, Dr. Minosh. So my question is that many countries across the globe, they heavily rely on tourism industry, which is a billion dollar industry. And as we have seen that uh, many uh, poor countries or developing countries, they uh, heavily rely on it and it has been hit. So how do you think they can cope up? Because as a part of digitalization, also tourism is something that can be experienced, like that has to be experienced uh, in a human form. So what do you think about tourism industry in the upcoming year? Yeah, well, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, tourism is, um, is, uh, is, is very physically based. And I think it is one of those industries that until we have uh, a vaccine and we have better ways of uh, dealing with the illness and treatment, uh, it will suffer massively. Uh, and I think that's a great tragedy, but you're, you know, I, I'm on the board of the British Museum and we've moved a huge amount of stuff digitally and online so people can see the objects uh, online, but it's not the same as seeing them in person. And um, I, think, uh, I think it just, you know, it's a, it's a very good reminder why we need to both quickly find a vaccine, improve our treatment methods, but also prevent this from ever happening again. Later today, I'm, I'm launching uh, something called the Trinity Challenge, which uh, is trying to work with a whole consortium of companies and institutions around the world to try and figure out how to prevent future pandemics. And it's interesting, if you think about, we've had four pandemics recently. We had SARS, we had MERS, uh, we had Ebola, and then we've had COVID. The first three were all localized. They were physically contained in a certain part of the world. In Ebola's case, you know, in, in, in parts of Africa, in Mears in the Middle East, and, and SARS in parts of Asia. They never became global pandemics. And uh, I think COVID has shown us the enormous catastrophe of allowing a pandemic to become global and the huge cost to everyone of that happening. And so we must, must, you know, there will be future pandemics, but we must, must, must figure out how, when they happen, we contain them uh, so that they don't spread geographically to the rest of the world. I think that is the medium term solution, really, 
to your answer about the future of tourism. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Hossam Badrawi. Dr. Hossam, my microphone is yours. Please unmute yourself and then add your question. Thank you, Dr. Hossam. Minush, it's lovely to see you and to listen to you. My question is um, in relation of uh, what happens in distant education, uh, technology and uh, the way of uh, student participation and its effect on democracy practicing. If we can test students and be sure that they are the ones answering the question, don't you think that this can change democracy practice in the whole world and having more participation of the people? Can you give me your ideas about that? Sure. So um, it's interesting that we've been talking about distance learning for a very, very long time. And the huge growth in what are called MOOCs, massive online courses that happened over the last decade was hailed as, ah, oh, MOOCs are gonna replace universities and everyone's gonna learn online and that kind of thing. In practice, uh, it has been initially less uh, less impactful than people had thought. Uh, and the main issue is that completion rates are very low. So many people say, oh, I'm going to take this cool philosophy course at Harvard online, uh, and it's for free, and I'm going to do it. And they start, and then they kind of never finish. They do a few lectures, and then they never quite complete it. And so the completion rates for most MOOCs is very, very low, below 10%. Um, Having said that, I think COVID has shown us that a blended model can be very effective. And what people are increasingly doing, including at the LSE, where we now do a lot of online short courses uh, and, and blended online uh, master's courses, is that you, uh, it isn't just there in a generic way. You, you have a cohort, you start with a group of other students, you study together, you have discussion groups, and it, it's on a sort of timetable, much more like a normal course. And in some cases, there is a blended element where you are physically present for part of the program. I think that has proven to be very successful. Learning outcomes are good and completion rates are good. And so I think that is, uh, has huge potential. And what's interesting is that the success of these online courses is greatest in some of the big emerging markets in countries like India, Brazil, and so on, where in China, where you can offer a very high quality education at much lower cost to large numbers of people. I agree with you, it also has implications for democracy. I was recently looking at um, the debate about online voting and why can't we vote online? Uh, and uh, wouldn't that increase participation and make our societies more democratic, especially for young people who are used to doing everything online. One country has tried it, Estonia. They have now had elections since about, I think, 2005 online, fully online. I mean, you can participate in person and you can do it online. There's a lot of debates around risks around manipulation and that kind of thing and surveillance, etc. But I do think that over time, it will become possible to democratize our societies even more by giving people the option to participate politically online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We one have question. another question uh, related to education with uh, Abdel Hamid Khairi. Abdel Hamid, microphone is on. Please address your question. Uh, hi, Minoush, and thank you, uh, Nile University, for arranging this. Uh, Minosh, last time I, I have met you in Biba in, in Egypt uh, in March, and you were talking about uh, uh, massive online uh, education, and you were giving an example of it cannot, the MOOCs cannot replace the real uh, education with a bunch of people coming to LSE from a state as doctors and looking at policies and legislations. Mm. Well, how to enable now? after pandemic, this was before the pandemic, of course, now, after the pandemic, mm -hmm. how do you think uh, uh, the MOOCs will evolve and enable the sharing of knowledge between highly class education or world class education like LSE, uh, London Business School, and all of those high school 
enabling the local to develop sustainably over the time and allowing the knowledge sharing to build the capacity in the local societies. And of course, this will have an effect of digitalization. Will it, it will be part of the enable and of the social security. This is very important part you talk of. And I think education can play a pivotal role into uh, uh, enabling the sharing of knowledge sustainably to create local education systems uh, to help us developing and evolving uh, all over time. Right. So I think what will evolve is a sort of tiered experience. Uh, for some people, a 100% online experience may be okay, and it will be the cheapest option. Uh, and there are already many possibilities out there of a purely online experience. At the LSE, we offer online short courses, uh, which are a lot more affordable. Uh, and at the end of it, you get a certificate that verifies that you've passed your exams for that online short course. At the next level, it will be a, a sort of more uh, blended local model. Uh, so, for example, uh, we participate with the University of London and uh, in a program where our faculty provide the curriculum and they grade the exams uh, and they provide the teaching materials, but it's taught locally in centers all around the world, including one that we're opening in, in Egypt, uh, where we will have local faculty working with our curriculum and our exams and so on, but teaching locally, again, a more affordable version than what you would get if you came to London. And then for those who can afford it, the, I think the version where you actually come to the LSE and you may get some of your lectures. We record all of our lectures now online and students can revise by listening to the lectures online. And we did that even pre-COVID. So students would come to the lecture, but if they wanted to revise and listen to it again, they could listen to it online. But that phys more physically present high touch version is obviously more expensive, uh, but will be a version that will be attractive to, to some people who can afford it. So I think that sort of tiered model is what we're going to see. Interesting. Uh, Thank you. Very really interesting. There's one question Thank from uh, Joni Golden Eyes asking what, what are the things that make large enterprises vulnerable and how can these companies address their vulnerabilities? Mm. I guess that the question is really in the context of COVID on, and I. I'm, I'm going to take it that way. I think the, the, the big vulnerabilities that COVID has revealed is companies that rely very heavily on physical presence that can't easily shift to digital options. So for example, the, the service sector that I've described, particularly things like hospitality or tourism, incredibly vulnerable. The more physical your business, the more risks you're running from pandemics. Um, I think, uh, I think the other thing is that obviously, this is an obvious thing to say, but you know, those who are running on very tight margins and who have very uh, small buffers uh, are unable to, to support themselves through this crisis. And obviously, if you're operating in a country in which the government can't help you very much, that is a huge vulnerability. Uh, in, in richer countries, governments have put in place very elaborate schemes to support industry to finance them through this crisis. But in developing countries, that support has been, has been less because they can't afford to do it. And so firms in those countries are at a disadvantage. Thank you. I think we only have time for one or two question maximum, Nizar, so. Yes, uh, we have a question from Mr. Mohammed or M. Magid or Magid about the climate change. Mohammed, or are you there? Please open your microphone to address your question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Baroness, um, uh, I don't hear very many things about the real exist existential threat that we're facing humanity in climate change. And um, uh, having um, the uh, opportunity to address you, uh, what, what is your take? How do you see us doing on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I couldn't cover everything in this talk, but that is definitely a huge issue and a big part of the debate about building back better. So uh, clearly the climate issue is there and it has not been, you know, it hasn't got any better because of COVID despite people flying less. Uh, in fact, the evidence is quite the opposite that 
you know, levels of carbon emissions are still very high. Um, and we are on track uh, for at least a one degree increase in global temperatures, and we have to do something to, uh, to slow that. I think many, many people are arguing that in some ways, COVID is an opportunity to, as part of the economic recovery, to do a massive increased investment in green technologies. You know, there are, in the, most people feel that part of the economic recovery has to be a large increase in government investment. And there is an opportunity if that government investment is focused on renewable energy, more, uh, more efficient transport systems, new kinds of cities that enable people to, uh, to commute less. There, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years, particularly emerging markets and developing countries are going to be investing trillions in new infrastructure. And the choices they make about that infrastructure, and if it is greener, uh, could be transformative in terms of what happens to climate change. And clearly, the advanced economies need to do their bit since they're responsible for the stock of, of carbon out there. Um, and the good news is, is that at least on the energy side, the renewable options are becoming incredibly competitive, solar, hydro, wind, and so on. And so I think if we can use this crisis as to mobilize political support for a greener recovery, that would be part of a, of a, of a much better post-COVID economy. Thank you. Um... Right now, I think uh, yeah, Breno has... Uh, and then as are, so I think uh, maybe it's uh, time to yeah. I think thank our Baroness for a wonderful talk and uh, for sharing her thoughts with us. And we really appreciated everything that you have uh, mentioned and... Uh, we would uh, love to see you when you uh, come to Egypt next time. Uh, so uh, we wish you the best of luck in everything that you do. And uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time and making the effort to be with us uh, in here. Thank you so much, Dar. And it was such a pleasure to see so many old friends and former colleagues participating in this event around the world. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. And uh, we just have uh, a thank you a certificate of appreciation for you in here, but we will give you a proper uh, recognition when you come next time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Tare, we may take the last thing before we uh, leave the, uh, the group photo. So I will ask everybody on stage, just please. Uh, Nizar likes to take group photos yes, of the group photos. It's a very remarkable uh, uh, point of time to have you with us. You can open up the camera for a group yes, photo. Yes, please. Uh, we can take Thank a group you. photo. So just a few seconds to let everybody open the camera. OK. Okay. Should be a very nice group photo. Yeah, just a <laughs> second. Uh, okay, I will take more than one shot, so please keep smiling. Lord, can so, you okay. open the camera? Or okay. Angus Lord, Lord, are you there? Fabio, yeah. Good. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you. David? Fabio. Uh huh. All right. Okay, I will take one shot. Okay, Thank more you. than more than one. So please just uh, keep smiling. Thank you. I'll take this one. Okay. Okay. One. Are Thank smiling. you. Okay. Hold on. One more. Okay. And the way, by the way, we have participation all the way from Brazil to the U.S. to Europe to India, and everywhere. So uh, we are glad that uh, you shared your thoughts with everybody. <laughs> okay, just to ensure that everything is there. Okay. Well done. Thank you very much.
Thank you all. Thank and you. Appreciate it. And then Thank you so much. Uh, for all the participants, please, we have panel discussions and we have the parallel sessions. So please, uh, you have the program and you have the Zoom link to the parallel sessions. So if everyone would tap into their Zoom link and get on time in the parallel sessions, and then we have the panel this afternoon, uh, the panel discussion. Thank you all for participating in this session, and we will see you in the following sessions. Thank you, Minouj, one more time. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.